you would turn in your New Testament to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 5. We have, again, been making our way through the Gospel. We spent some time last Sunday uh, looking at Mark chapter 4, and the chapter 5 really picks up at the end of chapter 4, where there is this amazing display of the power of Jesus Christ, and His disciples are truly uh, amazed by this. They're almost in awe of it. Uh, they are in the middle of a great storm, and their boats are filling up. And it seems as if Jesus is totally unconcerned. And they are seeking to wake him up there. It says in verse 38, in Mark chapter 4, verse 38, says, Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. Home. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? One of the greatest uh, travesties that, that we, we commit when it comes to God, the power of his word, what exactly Jesus is prepared and willing to do for us is to underestimate how much He can do. And, and in some ways, almost maybe limit uh, who actually is, is able to be benefited by the power of the gospel. And we're going to see that in chapter 5, because chapter 5 is Mark's answer to the questions that the disciples were asking. They were totally amazed never expected something like that to happen, never in their wildest dreams had ever actually believed that the person that was asleep in the boat with them actually had the ability to stop the waves, to stop the, 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 the storm. They couldn't, they couldn't fathom this. Uh, uh, this is beyond what, what, what they expected. And I would say for so many of us, this is precisely very may, may be the reason why at times... Uh, we are at a standstill when it comes to our mission and the gospel of Jesus Christ and what it is that we're supposed to be explaining to others and who can be benefited by our efforts. They had, a, they had, a, they had a, uh, an idea in their head of what they wanted to accomplish. And Jesus is trying to point out that there's something much, much bigger, much more um, powerful than what they had ever thought. And chapter 5 seeks to kind of give us some glimpses of just how much bigger Jesus' power is. And there are going to be three specific examples of scenarios that purposely Mark puts before us to kind of present almost impossible situations that seem like they're beyond help, they're beyond actually getting any better. And Jesus again shows up and who, who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey Him? Well, we're going to find that even uh, the demonic powers and those uh, evil forces that are very, very successful at pulling people away from God and causing great distress and turmoil in their lives. That these are the individuals who Jesus has come to save, has come to rescue, and there needs to be at times an, an inner calm and an inner peace and those disciples who are following him, that we might realize there are there is there's something bigger going on, something bigger that we're supposed to be serving with the purpose of the gospel. And there are individuals who are just as tormented in their lives, whose destruction has come in and actually actually ripped out all the peace and ripped out all uh, of the light in their life. And we're going to see and. An, amazing example of that with one individual Jesus comes in contact with. And again, the purpose that Mark is writing is so that we might understand what is this gospel that we have been given as those who believe in Christ, who follow Him, and who is it that we're supposed to be reaching out to? And we need to have faith in the power of the gospel to the level that it needs to to be displayed. And we're going to see that here. But I want to just quickly go through three of the scenarios in chapter 5. We're going to focus specific, specifically this morning on verses uh, 1 through 20. Let's just read together uh, the account of an individual who Jesus meets and his disciples are present with him. They are in the boat. They come to the other side past that storm. 
and across what seems to be someone who is beyond help. We need to underline that, that or have that thought in our minds as we think about chapter 5. We're talking about individuals who it would seem on the surface are beyond help. There's nothing more that can be done. They are beyond reach. And so we see in chapter 5, verse 1, one of those individuals that they meet. Verse 1 says, They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Here's an individual who is essentially out of mind, out of sight. That's how people have handled this individual. They, they, they tried. They did the best that they could. Uh, here's some, I, I, don't, I don't know what you do with somebody who, uh, frankly, is just screaming out in pain and, and, and fright and, and terror. Uh, what, what could you do if you saw somebody who you just happen to be going down the road and all of a sudden someone jumps, jumps out and, and terrifies you and they're, they're, they're cutting themselves, they're, they're self-mutilators. The, the, you see the pain within them and, and, and they're just lashing out. People try to subdue them. People try to chain them up and just basically say, I, I don't know what to do with someone like you. All, all I know to do is just keep you from harming anybody else. Tr try to maybe keep you from harming yourself as best as possible. And notice the key is that nobody could do anything for him. We've done everything we know how to do. And what they basically decided to do was when they realized that every option had been exhausted, they pretty much just said, okay, we're going to leave you up there. Just stay there. We'll stay down here. It was a pathway that was abandoned by many people. And the other gospels say that nobody could pass by that way anymore. So they decided to stop going by there anymore. We can't do anything for him. He's a danger to us. Just leave him up there. We, we, we did our best. He's just going to kind of be in, in the abyss out there. It says in verse 5, the faint relationship that most anybody had with him, just hearing him screaming. Verse 5 says, constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High? God, I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea. About 2,000 of them. And they were drowned in the sea. And so here, amazingly, here now Mark begins to answer. And he presents for us this amazing situation. Who is this? Well, let's present, let's present an, an, an impossible situation. A situation that is beyond our reach. Beyond mankind's ability to do anything to help them. And the, mess, and, and, and the, and the conclusion of the consensus of everybody is, leave them alone. Stop visiting them anymore. Stop seeing them. They are a danger to us and other people around us. Just let them alone. We can't do anything for someone like that. Remember, here's the question. The question of chapter, f and of chapter 4. Who is this? Mark's going to tell us who this is. <laughs> this is somebody, when confronted with a, someone as, as, as impossible as this, as dangerous, actually succeeds. He simply tells the demons, legions of demons, come out of him. And verse 10 says, begin imploring mercy not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby in the mountain. This amazing, dramatic shift changes where the demons leave the individual and now they enter this herd of swine. And what we see basically is this dramatic shift. But in this shift of where the demons are dwelling, we see their intention. The intention of those demons with the pigs was exactly what it was with the man. And we see that it was to destroy, to basically harm, and to hurt, and to eventually kill. 
And we're going to emphasize that as we come to the end of our lesson. Make no mistake about the demonic activity of Satan that is working in us through temptation. There is a reason why the scriptures teach those of us who are like this man, who are clothed and in our right mind. And that's the two individuals we're going to be talking about. There are those who have been clothed and in their right mind, who have been saved, who have been blessed by the power of Jesus Christ. And there are those who are still screaming. There are those who are still harming themselves. There are those who still, because of the influence of Satan in their life, and that is what the reason is, that is the cause. So many reasons why people leave people alone is because they don't know, they don't understand it. They don't know what to do about it anymore because it's not something that humans can solve. We cannot solve this with our own logic, our own reasoning, or our own power, or our own ability. And that's what's amazing about the gospel is the gospel has a power that reaches into someone that is beyond what some of the best efforts we have come up with as human beings to help or assist somebody who has this, become this level of a harm to themselves and people around them. And Mark wants you and I to recognize all sinners, all individuals, that Jesus has the ability to take someone like this, who one, in one day, all of a sudden, is just screaming out, crying out, uh, just to absolute terrorize themselves and others around them. And all of a sudden, notice in verse 14, the end of this. Here's the, here's the response in verse 14. The herdsmen ran away and reported in the city and the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind. The very man who had had the legion. I love how Mark emphasizes the very one that everybody else had basically said, leave that guy alone. You can't do anything for someone like that. We've tried, believe me. Emphasizing again that the power of the gospel and what its intentions are to do is to go beyond any effort that you and I can do. And sometimes we strive to do that. Our sense of shackling people or binding them is we just we, we, we try to fix the symptoms well, well well let me suggest this and maybe if you didn't have this problem in your life uh, maybe uh, maybe things would go all right sometimes it exhausts us we do that we try and remove certain symptoms out of someone's life and just say okay well well maybe if this is better then this will fix this problem and sometimes it works for a little while but those are our efforts. This is for a little while. For a little while, it said, oh, we got this big chain. Let's, let's chain him up. Worked for a little bit until we found that he broke those. It didn't work. And so people gave up. They threw their hands in the air and said, I can't do anything. For some, like, we're, we'll stop going near them. And all of a sudden, they get visited by Jesus. And he has this ability to release this individual from those demons. In verse 15, it says, They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim a Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. And so highlight that, that, that result. There are things that we need to have faith in the power of the gospel that goes beyond anything. Whether uh, we, we, we have faith in, in our, our, our ability or faith in, in, in some system that we think maybe makes somebody maybe a little less harmful to themselves, a little less harmful to others, only to find out that it only lasts for a short while. Because that's not using the gospel, that's using our methods, that's what people are doing. And again, it hinges back on what we talked about in chapter 4. 
Jesus was teaching all this in parables to sift through and find out the people that really saw the messed up situation that the demons had brought into their lives. It was evidenced through the physical uh, infirmities that they had, that, uh, other, other things that were going on that made it so evident that there was something going on that man could not do something about. And so Jesus was teaching these things in parables, hoping to find someone who would then develop the kind of faith and trust that says, yes, Jesus, you, you describe exactly the thing that's going on in me. I can't describe it. I don't really know exactly what's going on. I, I've tried this. I've tried that. I've tried to alter this in my life. And it just seems that no matter what happens, I keep going back and back. And it's just absolute misery and destruction. That's this man. It's a, it's, it's a depiction of so many things. Maybe we have experienced, maybe we know others who have experienced it. But to show us what God is intending to do through His Son, through His message of the power of the Gospel. And what we're going to see is then again, two other uh, events that Mark reveals to us, again showing us these are situations that seem to be beyond help. There's a guy that, that all of a sudden hears about Jesus doing some amazing things, and his name is Jairus, and he's a, a synagogue official. And so he comes up to Jesus, he has a sick kid. His daughter is very sick to the point of death, and he wants Jesus to do something about it. Jesus says, Okay, we'll go to your house. And they're on their way there. And Notice the description of a woman who begins to attach herself to a crowd that's growing around him. Let's read that in verse 21. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 says, When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. And so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him. And a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. And who, how can you blame it? All the great things that Jesus has been doing, all the amazed reaction of people saying, did you hear about the guy who was crying? I remember just left him alone. Remember years ago, we used to hear about that guy. Yeah, we, would just, we tried to help him and nothing could, could do anything for him. That guy is now at peace. He's not, he stops harming himself. And he's talking about this guy named Jesus. And all the great things that he's done for him. And so crowds of people are flocking to him. And there's in verse 25, it says, A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years, and notice verse 26, and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, had spent all that she had, and notice, here's the key, was not helped at all. That's the, that's the demoniac. He was not helped at all. People tried different things. Didn't really do much. She, she decided to go to physicians. Maybe there's some new, new technique. Some doctors come up. Maybe there's, there's some, uh, some, some new medicine that I have not discovered. Only to find out every time she went, it just made it worse. Well, despite this, what's the link? Was there anybody else that she maybe has heard about that also was an impossible situation? Yeah, this guy's been going on telling people what happened to him. Said, yeah, yeah, I, I was that guy. You were that you. I don't even recognize you anymore. You don't even look the same person anymore. Yeah, isn't it amazing what happened? Well, Jesus came and, and, and demonstrated this power that he had. And so now there's this woman. She's, she's an impossible situation. She's tried. She's gone to everything she possibly knows what to do and nothing helps her. But yet here's this, here's this Jesus. So notice what she does. In verse 27, after hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, 
Your faith. Your faith. Your trust that despite everything you've been trying. And Rhoda Sports, she's, she's been going to the experts. The leading experts experts that she knew to go to nothing could do a thing and all of a sudden there's this other expert she's never heard anything about except through hearsay through some other people that that, that have been talking about how they've been helped and the thought was maybe maybe if I just touch a part of his clothing <laughs> and it worked Like someone who, who, who hears a little bit about this gospel that, that, that we're talking about, that we're proclaiming. It's in His Word. It's in His teaching. It's in the things that He instructs us to have faith and trust, to, to buy into, to submit to. And I was going to say, if, if I just begin to maybe just, just the, 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 the fringe of the garment of some of His truths, if I just begin to start having a little bit of trust, this is the picture we see of someone who just has a little bit of trust, realizing, well, well, that's what this gospel keeps saying, is that I'm trusting so many things in this life, in this world, experts that seem to tell me, if I do this, this should be the result, and it doesn't happen. And yet Jesus says, there will be something different. Yes, for individuals who just have that mustard seed faith and are willing to say, well, well, well that's what, then let me try this. Let me try going to Christ. Let me submit. Let me just start beginning to, to, to see what happens Yes, it has the same ability and power to start removing the legions of demonic oppression or influence that is the bulk reason of the darkness and the despair in our lives. It is the absence of God that has brought the darkness into our world. And these are individuals who now are going to that light and finding out in amazing ways what's possible. And then we see another impossible situation. Remember Jairus? Jairus was, was going along and he's hoping his daughter's going to get well. Well, all of a sudden, he doesn't quite get all the way to the house and some, some friends come by and they say, guess what, Jairus? Your daughter's already dead. What they say is now we're talking about an impossible situation. What? can he possibly do? It was one thing to say, maybe he can, he can stop the, the sickness. Maybe, maybe he, can, he can reverse it backwards. But now she's died. What more can be done? Notice a possible situation in the eyes of his, of his friends. Notice it says in verse 34, He said, her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue officials saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore. In other words, now we're looking at something that's beyond repair. And notice what happens. Jesus hearing them say this in verse 36. Jesus overhearing what was being spoken said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, what is he talking about? Don't be afraid of potential disappointment. <laughs> That's where our faith is tested because we, we try so many things and someone says, well, here, come, 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 come here a lesson with us. Come to services with us. Come, 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 come here this, this, this discussion we're having in Bible class and, and start hearing the words of, of God and His power. And instantaneously sometimes there is that little bit of doubt. I, I, Tried other things, maybe kind of similar to that, and nothing seems to really work. Jesus looks at this individual. Here's the doubt. Here's the sentiment. It's, it's no use going through with this. And I love Jesus' statement. He says, don't be afraid any longer. Only believe. In other words, with Jesus, it is a 100% guarantee he has the answer. There is no, let me try it out and find out. No, <laughs> it will work. He will cast out that darkness in your life. He will replace it with light. All those other areas where you've tried it and, and failed and been disappointed, Jesus is that answer. 
And notice here, he trusts him. He says, okay, well, what have I got to lose? Verse 37, and he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official and they saw a commotion of people loudly weeping and wailing and entering and he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, and he entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And what I love about this is that essentially this would be the equivalent of a mother who sees their sleeping child. And you know, there's two ways, you know, to wake, wake somebody up. You know, you can get that... Uh, <laughs> A major alarm that I have to put to make sure I jump out of bed. Well, is the, is the roof caving in? Because <laughs> I realize I've got to have someone to get me moving. Or when you don't want to do that, right, you kind of gently, gently kind of nudge them up. That expression, little girl, I say to you, get up, was the equivalent of a mother who would kind of take a girl by the hand and just kind of gently sing, time to get up. He's doing this to a little girl that's just died. She's dead. And Jesus demonstrated again that, that, that fringe element of if I just do a little bit, here's just, here's just a little gentle demonstration of him taking her by the hand and saying, get up, wakey, wakey, little girl. Verse 42, immediately, immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. How does this happen? This is what we need to be infusing into the minds of doubters and individuals in this world, around us, relatives, neighbors, friends, of this power. This power is what they need to have faith in. Not the idea of, well, if you just come with us, gradually we'll just kind of wrap a chain around you and kind of protect you and you just dress you up and just do nice things. And then nice things will happen. Or are we actually inviting them to submit to the actual power of God's word and submit in awe of it and trusting that it can do more than what we, what we are able to to provide. All we can do is lead somebody to the truth. They need to be willing to see its power. And just like these individuals, trust that something can happen, connecting them together. But that's what we see in this first image. We see a dramatic demonstration of someone totally overpowered by the demonic forces. And isn't that amazing that that's such an, a vivid description but a very accurate one. So many individuals where Everything they touch seems to be self-destructive. That's the picture. Someone who, the, the influence of the demonic forces, they're just cutting themselves. They're harming themselves. There's some because of the influence of the darkness that has penetrated their soul, whether it's in some substance abuse, just continue harming themselves with a needle or a pill or a bottle. Or maybe it's relationships that they just uh, continually find ourselves in, in, in situations that are more destructive than they are helpful. And we all have our suggestions, our ideas of what might make that work. Well, that's the picture of all these three individuals. Try this. I, I did it. Well, well, maybe if you did this, I did. And there's only one source of power beyond our reasoning beyond our experiences beyond our suggestions and it has to be connected to an individual who realizes they are in desperate need of replacing this darkness with the light that God says is possible to shine in them and it's possible through the word if you come even if you're willing as this woman did just testing trusting just the, that mustard seed faith let me just touch the garment and see what happens Now that's the, po that's the possibility. But there's a second point I want to emphasize as we bring our lesson to a close and I wanted to emphasize this as well. There is another picture 
And the picture is of this individual who's clothed and in his right mind. What a blessing that so many of us, so many are here who once were lost, who now have been found. I think this also provides a great description and a great picture to show us do not get so close with sin that we become comfortable underestimating what its end result is. Its end result, we see it. It was to enter these pigs that they might just drown them in the sea. That was the road of destruction that those demons had when they entered this individual. There was a time when this individual was clothed and in his right mind, all of a sudden led on a different path. I want to very quickly remind all of us of our need to have our wits about us, to have our eyes open, and to realize how serious it is that we do everything possible to warn each other, encourage each other, watch out for the dark steps Satan wants you and I to step into. And they may not seem that dark to begin with. But all it takes is one step towards the darkness. And what is, what is the goal? To have us so consumed like this man with the legion. And Satan's very good at deceiving us and making us it's not going to be that bad. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. And, and to put it into context, here's a group of people who were filled with darkness. Remember Ephesians chapter 2 describes this, this audience of, of believers, of Christians, as you once were dead in your transgressions and sins. You were walking in darkness, but you were saved. Notice the instruction for people who are clothed and in our right minds. Notice what he says. What is our obligation now? It is to walk in light. To expose Satan for who he is, realizing that he is always trying to get us back in the darkness, not just a little bit, but to totally consume us. He, notice the language. Here's people again who once were darkness, now the light. Here's the warning. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk, of course, jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So here's what, what, what we're told to do. Therefore, in verse 7, he says, Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. Expose them for what? Yes, the evil that it is, but also what its intentions are. And I always try to, in my mind, have a link. Somewhere when I'm reading chapter 5 here, talking about you once were light, uh, or you once were darkness, now you're light. A great cross-reference in Ephesians chapter 5 is Mark chapter 5. You who are now clothed and in your right mind, that one temptation, that one possibility of sin, what is the goal? To bring you into bondage the way the man with the legion was. So that's a warning for us to make sure it is important that we continue to learn what is the righteousness of God that we might not go back to that point. So just two points I wanted to bring up in our, in our study of Mark chapter 5. One, impossible situations that Jesus alone was able to do something about. If that describes your situation, if that describes uh, something you can relate to, would you also have faith to believe that you have come to be in the right place? Individuals who trust God's word, who are striving to follow God's word. We follow him because he has the power. He is the light. He has the ability to cast off and, and unshackle us from all the dark forces that this evil uh, force of, uh, of wickedness has infiltrated in this world. And you're not going to escape it or get out of it by your own will or your own ability, or other people's suggestions. It's going to be achieved by your faith that Jesus is the answer. And your willingness to submit and let that power transform you.
It can. It will, no matter how impossible we may think the situation is. That's what Mark is telling us. And those of us who have been born again, are we stumbling? Are we going back into sin? Are we then getting, beginning to believe? Maybe, maybe it's almost impossible for me to get back where I once was. No, that you, can, you can start today by asking for help, encouragement, praying to God and seeking that help to give you that confidence to leave that sin and go back into walking in righteousness. But whatever your case is, we implore you, plead with you that you would have faith in Christ and the gospel that you would confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting, believing that baptism is his remedy for being reborn. Be baptized in water to be walking in newness of life. We encourage you to come to the front. When we will assist and help you, whatever your need is. If you need to re be redeemed, freed from these dark forces, let Christ do that through the gospel. Would you come and stand while we sing this song of encouragement together?